Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about structural racism, non-structural racism, health care, gun violence, and politics with Dr. Brian Williams. He is the author of The Bodies Keep Coming, Dispatches from a Black Trauma Surgeon on Racism, Violence, and How We Heal. He is also running for Congress in Dallas, Texas, where he became known in the media following the ordeal of trying to save the lives of multiple police officers shot in a mass shooting in 2016. Dr. Brian Williams, welcome to Talk World Radio. Dave, thank you for having me. It's a tremendous honor to be on your show. Thanks for coming on. There are so many things to talk about. I, I enjoyed your book very, very much. So many topics in it. First, I just have to ask you, because it's on my mind the past couple of days, do surgeons carve the very best jack-o'-lanterns? <laughs> I, 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 I'm good at uh, putting things together, but that sort of intricate design, maybe the plastic surgeons are, but trauma surgeons, we're just going there to save lives. They just want to save the lives. <laughs> okay. Well, you can save the smashed jack-o'-lanterns, maybe. Uh, <laughs> on, a, on a more serious note, a career as a surgeon probably strikes a lot of people as a way to avoid or to experience less racism. But your story maybe says otherwise. Can you recount some of your experiences? Absolutely. I, I, I went into medicine after a career in the Air Force. I was in my prior career, I was an aeronautical engineer, uh, serving as an Air Force officer, transitioned to medicine uh, because I wanted to be uh, a healer. I had these I idealistic, uh, I had these ideals about what it meant to serve humanity by being a doctor and a healer. Uh, I didn't see it as a means of escaping racism. By that point in my life, I just kind of accepted that that was going to be part of my my life that I had to uh, uh, to navigate. Uh, but it was surprising some of the vitriol I did experience from patients and and colleagues uh, by being a black by being a black surgeon, being a black doctor. Um, for example, going into patients' rooms in my white coat, clearly doctor garb, and being asked to remove the trash or take out half-eaten trays of food. Uh, by being called racial slurs at all stages of my career. Um, but that did not dissuade me from um, becoming the best doctor I could because uh, I wanted to give back to communities that were underserved. Uh, I chose to work at safety net hospitals and underserved communities are frequently racial and ethnic minorities as well. So I felt by being a black doctor serving these communities, uh, it was incumbent on me to push through all that uh, to become the best servant to my community that I could. There's, there's also in your book a lot of the history of how we got here. Why are black surgeons so remarkably rare and what does it have to do with this history of the professionalization of medicine and the charging of so much money for education, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I use my experience in medicine and in the book with these personal stories to address some of the larger topics that we are dealing with in our time, uh, structural racism, gun violence, healthcare inequality. And by talking about the, the, the lack of black doctors, particularly black male doctors in medicine, uh, I want to explore these bigger issues. Uh, it's, it's, it's shocking to me that there are less black men entering medical school now than there were in the 70s, right? Despite there being more you know, medical schools, more opportunities in the medical school, the, the, the pipeline uh, has, has decreased. Now, how do we, how do we change that? There are so many way, areas to intervene, to intervene. And uh, you know, a lot has to do, do with getting to kids when they're younger, but also the opportunities that young people have when it comes to education and stable housing and uh, food insecurity. These things you don't think about that may impact opportunities for people to uh, to progress are a societal issue that will benefit us all if we if we address them. And it's not just in medicine. I think you can pick any other profession 
and you will find similar uh, disparities in representation, whether it be education, uh, the legal profession, uh, banking, similar issues exist. The question is, what do we do as a society to provide opportunities for all to thrive? You, you also talk about some of the horrible history of, of testing on populations without consent, experiments by the military and others. Uh, and you suggest that medical testing still in new ways targets particular populations. How, how is this possible today? Yeah, so uh, in telling this story, I wanted to use personal stories my experience as a doctor, but also wanted to teach the reader about uh, some glaring issues. And one is the uh, the exploitation of Black people for medical experimentation. Now, probably the most well-known is Tuskegee, uh, the experiment that was run by the federal government to study how syphilis progressed. When we had a cure, the cure was denied to Black men uh, who subsequently infected their partners and their children. But there are other uh, examples. Uh, J. Marion Sims, who's known as the father of obstetrics, did really barbaric operations on enslaved women without anesthesia. Uh, uh, and some of the techniques are still taught today. Uh, some of the instruments he developed are still used today. Uh, we did whole body radiation of Black people uh, to study the effects of you know, a nuclear bomb going off. Uh, and Predictably, most of them died uh, up until, you know, even when I was born, they were still doing forced sterilization of young Black women. Uh, so some of these were uh, experiments that were definitely uh, supported by the government. But today, to your question, how does it, how does it continue today? And, and we have a system where we call exception from informed consent, which allows us to do clinical trials on people without their informed consent, meaning I don't have to tell you what's happening and get your permission to do it. Usually done in emergency situations where people can't speak for themselves. Uh, but looking at all the data, most of these experiments, these trials are done on, you know, about a third that were done between 1990 to the present were done on, on Black people. And most of these people actually died. So in a way, the sort of exploitation of Black Americans for medical experimentation is continuing. Uh, but I will say this, I would not say that experimenters are intentionally taking advantage of Black people, but I think we need to understand how what we're trying to do to advance medical science does exploit certain groups of people without their knowledge. That is something that we need to address and be honest about. Indeed, we are speaking with Dr. Brian Williams. The, the book is called The Bodies Keep Coming, Dispatches from a Black Trauma Surgeon on Racism, Violence, and How We Heal. Uh, and it is full of, of concepts I had never heard of, uh, such as a trauma desert uh, along the lines of a food desert, a neighborhood with no supermarket, a neighborhood with no trauma surgery capacity. Uh, never heard of it before. Uh, and, and also wonderful uh, debunking of phrases that are simply common speech, like race is a risk factor or black on black crime. Can you, can you explain why some of these phrases are not helpful? Uh, absolutely. Let's just start with black on black crime. Uh, it's usually a trope that I, that I feel demeans and dehumanizes black people with the assertion that Black people are, are violent and commit violent crimes against um, the same race, you know, black on black crime. I think it speaks for itself. But I, I bring in statistics from the Department of Justice, which shows that white on white crime occurs at the same rate as black on black crime. And the question is, why is that? We live in a segregated society. We generally live in neighborhoods with same race individuals, and violent crime usually about proximity, who's closest to you. So uh, black on black crime occurs at the same rate as white on white crime based on statistics from our own Department of Justice. So in telling these stories, I didn't want to just give you my opinion, but I wanted to give you the sources that you can also look at yourself. So that was one thing I really wanted to, to, uh, to debunk among, amongst other sort of tropes that I felt were 
incorrect and demeaning to uh, racial and ethnic minorities. As someone who works on areas of peace and war more than other topics, I'm struck by the similarity to the fact that we think of so many African nations as violent, despite the fact that they manufacture not a single weapon and most of the weapons are imported from the United States, uh, without which they could not be uh, this violent. Um, and, and most of the coups are led by people trained by the United States military, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to ask about your experience experience with police uh you know prior to being confronted with this this emergency of having to treat multiple police officers what were some of your experiences with police how do, how did you think about police yeah so you know in the moment of that mass shooting of police officers their profession was didn't matter to me. It was like these were injured in, individuals whom I had to care for uh, with as a trauma surgeon, try to try to save their lives. Uh, but uh, I've, I've had my own encounters with police, uh, which I've you know I've, I've learned from a very young age, taught by my mother, how I am supposed to behave to protect my own personal safety when encounter when encountering police officers. And that says a lot about her experience as a child and what she learned. Um, so I've been pulled over by police, and I tell you, it's it's uh, I get fearful. That, that is a that is a uncontrollable physiological response to. No matter if I do everything right in a situation, it could go badly. And an event that occurred here in Dallas was when I was standing outside of my, my apartment complex waiting for a ride to the airport, and a police cruiser pulled up. Two officers got out approached me, and in that moment, I froze, just really concerned about what was about to happen. Now, I'll say they were professional, they, you know, there was no threats to me, but that, that feeling was still there. And I later learned that someone had called 911 and reported a, a bald Black man acting suspiciously. And that was a trigger that brought the police there uh, to my apartment complex where I live. And I think we now recognize that that phone call, in some ways, could have led to someone's death, right? We know that now. Uh, uh, so um, that, that's just one experience, but, but one of many I can describe over the course of my lifetime. Yeah, and there are many in the book, uh, which people should read. And of course, the acting suspiciously was standing there. That was that was exactly. the suspicious behavior. Um, the, the, the other thing, one of many incidents that struck me in the book, you, you've had to try to save many shooting victims uh, and then tell their loved ones about deaths when they were not saved. And, you know, I, I'm struck by the fact that police officers in these incidents don't bother to say they're sorry, don't bother to understand that they're traumatizing somebody. Uh, and in one of these cases, uh, one of these loved ones, as you're struggling to tell them that their loved one has died, has the presence of mind to tell you it's okay, doctor, we understand, you don't need to say it, you know? And can you talk about what that, what that meant to you? I'm actually still very close with that family to this day. That was the father of one of the police officers um, that died the night of the mass shooting in July of 2016. And as I was, I always try to get this conversation right when I'm trying to tell a family member about the death of their loved one due to gun violence, because you know I change out of my bloodied scrubs, put on clean scrubs, white coat, you walk in to deliver this news to uh, someone. And I want to ensure that I, I do not add trauma on top of trauma. Uh, but as I'm going through talking about what happened and how we tried to save their son, he stopped me and said, what you said, you know, I, I know my son is dead, uh, thank you. I thank the entire team. I know you did everything you could. And uh, that stuck with me, not just because he did that, but because of what was going on outside the hospital. There was this mass shooting of police officers at a racial justice protest. Uh, the shooter was black. Uh, there was a lot more wrapped up into this incident. And in that room, none of that mattered. It was just, thank you for doing what you could. And um, I, like I said, I'm still close to them to this day. But just to be able to think about someone else when it's your son that's died is, is remarkable. Um, the That mass shooter in Dallas in 2016, like the one this month in Maine, and like over 31% of U.S. mass shooters, 
was a military veteran. Uh, needless to say, virtually every veteran is not a mass shooter, but also virtually every domestic abuser and gun purchaser and Nazi sympathizer and mentally ill man is not a mass shooter. And yet there are thousands of news reports on those topics. Uh, while there's never yet been a single major media report on the fact that mass shooters are very disproportionately veterans. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, I, I think we, actually I know we need to do a better job of unpacking gun violence and the different types of gun violence we have. Mass shootings being one type, which only account for less than a percent of all firearm deaths per year. But I think it dominates most of our media coverage, right? Uh, we have suicides, intimate partner violence, homicides, unintentional shootings, each have, have different root causes, which require different uh, types of solutions. Uh, the mass shootings, I think an underreported under story is that most mass shootings occur in racially segregated uh, neighborhoods uh, because a mass shooting is defined as shooting of four or more people in one incident by the same shooter. Uh, but those get very little coverage, right? We talk about these ones that dominate the national consciousness because we can see ourselves at a movie theater. We can see ourselves uh, at the bowling, bowling alley or some of these public places. And that's what brings this uh, uh, dominates the discussion. So if we really unpacked mass shootings, uh, the shooters and the cause, I think we can do a lot towards know, doing a better job of keeping our communities and children safe uh, uh, from uh, from gun violence. And but many of them have been trained to use those guns by right. dollars through the U.S. military, and most of the rest of them are pretending they're in some war and dressing up right. like they're in the military. Um, so there is something the matter with the war culture. We live in. Um, I, I I hang out with peace activists, and they like to say fund healthcare, not warfare. But you point out in the book that the U.S. spends even more on healthcare than it does on warfare. It just spends it so inefficiently that it gets worse results than many other nations whose models it could easily draw on, but doesn't. You, Dr. Brian Williams, are running for Congress. What would you like? the last wealthy nation on earth to figure out health care or for that matter, retirement or education or infrastructure to do differently. Yeah, running for Congress was, it is, it is a means for me to take my experience as a veteran and as a doctor and community leader and bring a crucial voice to the table in Congress about how we can address the, say, the health care crisis. There are only 19 doctors in Congress, so we need more of us to understand what's at stake addressing this. And we, so we continue to spend a lot more money on our health care, um, but we don't get the outcomes <laughs> that other comparable nations do that spend much less. So that is a disconnect. If we're going to spend more and more money, we should have much better outcomes than we are having. But we invest a lot in health care. We should invest more in health. And what do I mean by that? There are so many things that keep us healthy uh, beyond us going to see the doctor regularly. Uh, just having uh, stable housing, a good education, uh, or access to a good education, uh, nutritious food. These are the social determinants of health that are outside of the hospital that impact our health. And studies have shown about 80% of our health comes, comes from these. So that is something that we need to address through policy, local, state, and federal policy, and how do we invest more in our communities so that everyone can thrive and be healthy. And a lot of our money, a lot more of our money is going to the sick side. Like We want people to be sick so we can treat them to continue to fund the healthcare system, and we should be investing in health to keep people out of the hospital. Well, I couldn't agree more, but in terms of health coverage, uh, we've got these wonderful inventions called health insurance companies, and other countries have governments that handle health coverage, uh, single payer. Medicare, instead of privatized, lowered the age to cover everybody and expanded to cover everything. Uh, when 
all the other countries have figured this out. They're not perfect, but they've more or less figured it out. Why, why shouldn't the United States as well? Oh, that's it. We can figure it out. We have the resources and ingenuity. Uh, we have to start where we are now. We have and accept that we have all of these different types of health coverage systems. I will start with the VA health system, which is the largest integrated health system in the country, uh, covers our veterans. I mean, there's a lot of good things <laughs> that are happening within a health system. We have private insurance, uh, uh, employee sponsored insurance, Medicare. Uh, Medicaid, and the challenge is how do we increase coverage for everyone without increasing costs? Uh, that is the perennial uh, tension. By covering more people, we, we increase costs. But part of this is, we, like I said, we need to invest in the health of our population. And uh, isn't a quarter the, to a third wasted on insurance companies? Don't you cut out, get rid of the insurance companies, have a single payer system? Don't you save a quarter to a third of the money right there? Well, there's a, with the health insurance companies, that's part of the solution is how much money is, I mean, there are a lot of, perver there are a lot of perverse financial systems within our healthcare system. And uh, the private insurance companies is one piece of that. Uh, we could talk about pharma as well. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is a good start to getting more coverage in and, and an affordable way and, and improving outcomes. Uh, we have so many different types of healthcare systems within this country, not just one healthcare system, that we have to somehow put all these pieces and puzzles together in a way that will give more coverage to everyone without increasing costs, but also providing better outcomes. And the health insurance companies are, are one part of that that we need to address. I, I, I'm speaking here on a show called Talk World Radio and 96% of the world is outside the United States. Um, well over half of federal discretionary spending in the US government is spent on militarism. But like most congressional campaign websites in existence, if it weren't for the mention of veterans, there would be no hint that the world even exists on your congressional campaign website. What do you think that military spending should be? The single item that takes up over half of the job you're applying for, should it go up? Should it go down? What should it be? Well, military spending encompasses a lot. I think we we will consider the boats and the planes and uh, the equipment, uh, but a lot of it is also for our the the uh, salaries of our volunteer service members. Some of that goes to the, the health care for our volunteer service members as well. So that is a complex budgetary item, and uh, the fifty percent number. I have to look into that. Uh, I need to learn more about that, covering 50% of the discretionary spending. Uh, is that what you said, 50% of discretionary spending? or Well, well over 50% of federal discretionary spending, if you look at the military budget, including the nuclear weapons in the so-called energy department, in, including uh, it, it, all the aspects of every department, uh, but principally the, the enormous Pentagon budget. Uh, it's it's over half of the money you're dealing with. Um, but even if it were five or ten percent, and it was anything other than military, there would be a topic, a big section about it in the in the platform of people running for Congress. It wouldn't be absent from all of these campaign websites. If I had a chance to vote for you or encourage people to donate to your campaign. I would want to know which wars do you want to end? Which wars do you want to continue? And what, if any, wars do you want to start? I, I can't find it. Well, I, I, right. So I, I, I lean back on my uh, experience as a veteran. I, I went to the Air Force Academy. Uh, I chose to be a volunteer service member. I'm a son of a career veteran. In fact, I come from a long line of veterans that have served back to the Civil War. So. Uh, I recognize that military service is core to uh, protecting the values that we profess in the Constitution about life, 
liberty and, and justice. And uh, so when I when I criticize what we're doing in this country, that's out of love. Like I feel that there's there's more we can do to manifest all of these I, I, ideals. Um, and being a military service member was part of my way to give back uh, to to the country. Uh, but also we were taught that none of us really we didn't want to go to war, we didn't relish going to war, but if we had to defend the, co the constitution of our country, we wanted to make sure that we, we did it right. Um, but it's not. Can you name a recent you know, war that defended any lives or liberties? I, I'm asking you, which wars would you continue? Would you continue the war in Ukraine? Would you continue the war in Gaza? Wh which wars would you end? Which dictatorships and democracies, so-called, around the world would you continue to send weapons to? Which wouldn't you? Which treaties would you seek to have the United States uh, join or comply with, and which not? Which of the 900 or so military bases ringing the globe would you close or open? Uh, you know, people are interested in these things if they're going to vote for somebody when the U.S. government is, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to focus on this topic, we've got about two minutes left, but the U.S. government is principally a war machine with some side projects. And you're running for the position of, of being in control of the U.S. government. You have to have positions, right? Yes, I do have positions. And I feel that we, uh, we do not abandon our allies during times uh, of need. We have these allies around our allies around the world, uh, and as a country, America is a leader economically, militarily around the world. And when there is these conflicts, we do not abandon our allies. Um, we have multiple going on right now. It, it's complex, um, but we can't just we cannot just walk away uh, from our obligations to stand by our our allies. If it risks nuclear war, is that worth it? If the money that's going into the war could have saved hundreds of times the lives that are being killed in the wars, is it worth it? If it prevents global cooperation on crises that aren't optional like poverty and homelessness and climate collapse is it I, I have to I, I have to trust that our military leaders and our our civilian leaders that have all the information about what is happening are making the proper decisions to do what's best to uh Defend, no, stand by our allies and uh, keep America safe. Uh, if I become a member of Congress and I have access to more information, I will certainly be thoughtful about what I support uh, uh, going forward. Uh, but I just think as, as a whole, uh, with our standing in the world, uh, people look to America for leadership during times of uh, peace and, and conflict, and we just cannot walk away from that. Well, I can't walk away from a genocide underway in Gaza either, and I can't trust the people who are doing it to somehow know that it's justified because it so obviously is not. Uh, get the book. I do recommend the book. I don't recommend the candidate. Uh, Dr. Brian Williams, The Bodies Keep Coming, Dispatches from a Black Trauma Surgeon on Racism, Violence, and How We Heal. Thank you very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, Dave. Appreciate the time to talk about these very complicated uh, issues. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.